Mass Effect 3 may have the most universally hated ending in video games. After five years, players had a deep-rooted investment in the world, so after the ending came out, many were left disappointed. But why was this? My gut reaction to the response that Mass Effect 3's original ending received in 2012 was that people simply weren't expecting a tragedy, and so never really saw it for what it was. Through that sting of seeing hundreds of hours of investment into a character boil into atoms before your very eyes. This is, honestly, an unfair stance for me to take, and I've always wanted to really break down what the player is given that might contribute to the negative reactions it got. But it stands that, as a starting point for examining Mass Effect, we all have to agree that the end falls squarely in the you died camp and not in the you got hitched. Since humanity started telling stories, we've been sorting them into tragedy and comedy. For this video, I wanted to explore why tragedy resonates in video game narratives so strongly, and why it doesn't always go over so well. Before we dive in, let's take a moment for me to be clear. This is only opinion. I'm talking about things I love, and I think it's important that I don't come across trying to cheapen the experience for others. Tragedy is intrinsically tied to emotion, and I'm not in the business of telling people that their emotions are invalid. I say this because it can be really tough to discuss without touching nerves, but in the end, super interesting, and even cathartic. First, I quickly want to cover setting video game melancholy apart from other media. A distinction is often proposed between the passive narrative of other media and the active narrative of games. The only storytelling medium that demands tactile engagement to further the plot. Not a new idea by any means, but my examples hinge on the implication that you are playing the role in a story, and all the weight that brings with it. This concept of actively occupying a narrative from within may explain why tragedy in video games is felt so sharply. When it hits, the experience can become something of a cultural touchstone, an experience which people are eager to share. Take Ares' death in Final Fantasy VII for example. Having an active and important member of your party suddenly die at the end of disc 1 should have been met with major outcries. Hours of grinding and stat building suddenly ripped from the player, but instead it served to paint just how important and further push Cloud's motivations for taking down Sephiroth are. Or something like the end of Shadow of the Colossus. Wanda slowly decays and has evil manifest inside of him. Instead of just resurrecting the one he loves, it ultimately takes his life and is reborn as the child with horns. Both of these instances are equally tragic and prove that tragedy absolutely has a place in gaming narratives. These experiences are valuable, of course. Entire books have been written dedicated to asking why tragedy gives us pleasure, so I'm not here to argue that tragedy has value. I'm going to treat that as a given. Shepard's death in the end of Mass Effect 3 is unavoidable. It's a fixed point in the narrative. This concept of fixed and fluid moments in game narratives is going to weave through this section on mechanics, because Mass Effect has specific mechanic provisions for fluid narrative moments, but still has an overall fixed story. People complained about not really being able to choose the ending of Mass Effect 3, but of course you couldn't, just like you couldn't choose the beginning. Sure, you can choose Shepard's backstory and how they got to where they are, but the beginning of Mass Effect 1 is always going to be fixed. You will always start on Eden Prime, and so too is the end of the story. But it's the fluid moments within the game that let you forget that the story has been scripted. And there's no true way to script something wholly and entirely fluid. The dialogue and alignment mechanics in Mass Effect both straddle this line between a fluid moment of storytelling and an overarching plot. These tools the game gives you color the fiction in a much more direct way than many other games. Allowing you as a player a defined way to pitch and yaw through the story. Making it yours and generating connection. Not just to the characters, but to your version of the universe it takes place in. The Paragon Renegade alignment system is part of this too. The game is constantly asking you to decide how Shepard gets the job done. I'd posit this reception to the ending is intimately tied to this mechanic and its shortcomings. Any fan of the game can probably tell you that it always seems like the better move to make the Paragon choice, barring a few Renegade trigger pull reactions, which simply can't be passed up. The rules and tools of the alignment system are supposed to contribute to this narrative coloring I mentioned getting you into character and building the world. They don't serve this end when one is always better than the other, and when you don't feel free to mix them up, as the games have a reputation for punishing you when you don't stick to one or the other for most of the story. In fact, the alignment system really shines when it's abstracted away from you, and you don't have any cues to tell you what's going on. An example of this does exist in the games. It's in Mass Effect 2, during the final decision of Legion's quest, A House Divided. When the mission starts, Legion tells you of a virus that could potentially sway all Geth to become heretics. After landing on the ship, he says there are two options, blow up the ship, killing a large portion of the heretic Geth along with the virus, or rewrite the virus to bring back the wayward Geth. 
The choice doesn't give you any input on the ethics or outcome of the situation, but the decision does matter, and it's a decision that really feels like it's achieving the role-playing goals that the Paragon Renegade alignment system often feels like it's falling short of. Mass Effect 2 does this again, after your crew is taken by collectors, by intentionally not telling you exactly what will happen by choosing to go after them or completing other time-sensitive missions first, that decision is not made based on blue or red, it's made in character. If you feel compelled to drop the rest of your responsibilities and rush to the aid of your friends, the game rewards you. They're still alive when you get there. The point is, the fixed narrative is being imposed on you in a way that makes sense to you, as a character operating within the fiction. This is my argument for squaring the circle of scripted and fluid. There's really only one ideal path, but the writing has ensnared you to the point where it's the one you want to take regardless. Mass Effect 3's final decision is like this choice to pursue the collectors near the end of Mass Effect 2, and it's no coincidence that the storytelling often calls back to its center when it reaches the end. Your last decision as Commander Shepard is written to be coy about this alignment system, which has been granting you a veneer of agency in the opera surrounding you. You get a Paragon option and a Red Engade option catch is, they've been flipped from what you've been taught to expect from the last 50 to 150 hours of gameplay. Your perception as a player of the elusive man is that he embodies those renegade choices. He's the ruthless one who plays foil to your paragon in the final game. Even if you do play renegade, Shepard still champions destruction over control. And it's not until you reach the catalyst that you see plain as day that things just aren't that simple. The catalyst patiently explains to you, mechanically speaking, the metric that organics and synthetics apply to reality has broken down. The Catalyst tells you the Reapers don't work anymore, and it's your responsibility to overcome an impossible problem, with limited tools. Bioware tells you the same thing here about their game. Neither option is very good. This Paragon Renegade business isn't nuanced, and isn't going to help you overcome your final hurdle. You'll have to evolve, just like the Catalyst implies that organic life can't overcome their final hurdle without evolving. So they give you the third option. If you followed along, you see where I'm driving. Just like rushing after the Collectors, an obvious character choice opens up before you. In the very end, neither option is good, so the solution is pick neither. Synthesis is the option that I first experienced. And my argument is that at least someone at Bioware intended you to take the third option, but attempted to make it a choice, which the player ideally realizes was what they always wanted. A new way to forge through the shitty alignment system. Shepard's story is on so many levels building up to this moment. Bioware even put the damn thing in front of you, and it's a much shorter walk than the other two. My question is this. Should you have been given the choice at all? Hear me out, imagine a version of Mass Effect 3 where there's one end instead of three and you don't choose anything, it just plays out as a cutscene. If Bioware had doubled down on the final sacrifice at the end, it could have A, given the series a definitive ending that entered into the canon of everyone's favorite sad moments in games, and B, actually made fans happier than three non-committal endings. I can imagine there would be an outcry over no final choice at first, but I really don't think people would be that upset if the idea that there should be a final choice was never there at all. Some fans may have even found it to be an evocative and powerful decision to turn the end into a moment where the tenets of gameplay from the series are turned on their head. I believe at the very least the synthesis option shouldn't be gated behind the military strength mechanic. As a player invited into the story, you are opening yourself up in a uniquely emotional way. Protagonist death is a complex thing to unpack. But suffice to say, it is not at all surprising that people would feel betrayed by an ending that knocked them down after spending three games building them up. You worked so hard and got so far. You are part of Mass Effect, and a tragedy begs the question, is it your fault? Well, not if you never had a choice. Not if you simply did the best you could, and it was always going to end like this. You'll notice I've talked about protagonist death a lot, and some of you may be wondering if I'll touch on the indoctrination theories, which explain a possible end which Shepard is implied to survive. Let me first say I love the indoctrination theories. Any story with the depth to support conspiracy is fun, and I love reading the sort of stuff that keeps you up at night connecting dots. Personally, I don't put any stock in them as canon. I took the events of the third option at face value for a few key reasons. Following Shepard's death, there's no reason for the game to keep showing you events happening to other characters unless they are actually happening. Shepard probably isn't indoctrinated because they are capable of taking down both Saren and the elusive man from their indoctrinated states. Indoctrinated in fighting seems like an oversight. I am uncomfortable with the idea that the dream sequences you play through are evidence of indoctrination, rather than intentional discussion of the horror of war, PTSD, and the insane stress of being made a political figurehead. Those moments are humanizing, and to explain them as monstrous doesn't sit right with me. Real people experience similar things, and their experiences are not science magic. I'd guess that the scene in which it's implied Shepard survives is intended to sweeten the deal for those who pick destroy. Otherwise, the option has nothing. 
it's the worst by far, forcing you to commit genocide and destroy the lover of one of your closest friends. It feels like a way to justify having it there, again leading me back to my argument that Bioware knew that the series ending needed to be strong, and the strongest way to end it would be without a choice. But they ultimately could not do that, and this implication of survival is an appendix of an attempt to weave an illusion of entropy over the story's most thematically viable end, which was Synthesis. I'm well aware that people from Bioware have stated that there's no canonical ending to Mass Effect 3. With Andromeda out, many people want to know how it will connect the trilogy, myself included. Frankly, I think denying a canonical ending is kind of a cop-out. Andromeda is attractive to me for the same reason that Rogue One was interesting. It looks like someone's tabletop fiction got turned into a game or film, respectively. Mass Effect is still an interesting setting for role-playing games, and I assumed that if they did something more with the universe, it would be adjacent to the trilogy, that is, happening within the same time frame. But as a friend of mine pointed out, it's hard to care about any storylines in a setting when the main one is so big. This is a good point, and I think I'll have to play Andromeda to really have an opinion on it. As far as its existence coloring the end of the original trilogy goes, I invoke Death of the Author, which as we all know is a powerful spell that gives me control over Mass Effect 3 canon if I am able to kill Mac Walters in single combat. Even the third end leaves some loose ends. It's not enough to simply classify loose ends as good or bad. They can be either. They can be both. A good denouement is satisfying. But so too can be the hope embedded in a story that ends tragically, but implies more. The loose ends that the player is left with following the end of Mass Effect 3 fall in this latter camp. The Reapers are gone. The problem that necessitated them has been rendered irrelevant. The Catalyst has fulfilled its purpose, and cycles won't repeat themselves. The galaxy is free to progress into an age of unknowns. The cycles had always trimmed civilization short, and so the end is inherently riddled with open ends. Where did the Catalyst come from? What happens to the forces gathered at Earth? Where is the Normandy? Are they stuck there? What is the exact nature of the new synthetic organics? But the biggest question is this. Are these questions deal breakers? Can you call the end objectively bad because of these gaps? The answer is yes and no. The second time I played through, I did so with all the possible DLC installed. The extended cut epilogue offers nothing but to make explicit answer to the minor questions, answers which the player can come up with, and should, as it serves to make tragedy more inviting as a resolution. Of course the Normandy isn't permanently stranded. You've spent enough time with Joker to know by now that he'd be crushed in his last scene if the Normandy was irreversibly damaged. Instead he's busy being elated at the prospect of a new dawn, a new frontier, doing an Adam and Eve bit. These loose ends are not deal breakers, and didn't really need the monologue the extended cut offers. The Citadel DLC provides closure people really wanted. The base game's tone is tough to swallow overall. It deals directly with PTSD as mentioned in the dream sequences, and grows progressively more and more taxing emotionally and mentally on Shepard and the player. The raw denial of a release before the final battle has pros and cons, but I feel that with the Citadel DLC installed, the pacing isn't broken. The Citadel DLC gives players the comic relief they need to decompress before the final act. Being the last lot of content ever released for Mass Effect 3, it served as a return to old friends in a pulpy style story that brought the gang, or what's left of them depending on how you play, just to see what everyone was up to all before it comes to a close. It should have been part of the main game, and the extended cut shouldn't exist. Now, let's focus on the Catalyst. A major critique I've heard of the Catalyst is as its function in the story as Deus Ex Machina, loosely translated to English as the God of the Machine. The term is from Greek theatre, used to describe god characters being dropped into the stage via crane to fix all the shit at the end. People now tend to treat it as a literally ancient played out trope, and so inherently useless in modern storytelling. People who took this perspective on Mass Effect 3's Catalyst may have overlooked that the Catalyst is a literal god in a machine. The Catalyst plays some literary roles in the story which should have been built up to this point, but aren't to the degree that needed to be, unless you have all the DLC. Mass Effect has intentionally been writing a story of transhumanism. Edie's character arc is a major threat in Mass Effect 3, and deals directly with artificial intelligence and the existential question the game is, and has always, been driving at. The geth Quarian conflict coming to a head, and your exploration of the history behind the Geth uprising is narratively significant on the transhumanism front too. Moments from earlier games, like the VIs you interact with and Project Overlord in Mass Effect 2, Contribute to the final conversation with the Catalyst being highly symbolic of the pinnacle of synthetic reasoning and the pinnacle of organic reasoning coming into contact for the first time in the cycles. But there's an undertone of something else at work in the story here, the occult. It is subtle, but Mass Effect has always dealt with fear, 
Fear of what's out in space, and fear of what's inside of you. The unknowable mysteries of the universe is a the theme of storytelling associated with Lovecraft and the Cthulhu mythos. Now, the technology wielded by you and your allies hasn't seemed all that crazy while playing the game. After all, that handy codex tells you how it all works. But the catalyst is technology the game does not intend to explain. The elevator that takes you to the final platform is silent and inexplicable in the way it moves. Everything associated with the catalyst, the crucible, the citadel, is all abstract and obtuse. Bioware are nodding at Arthur C. Clarke's third law. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And so we can apply the literary thought, the old god in the machine. Cosmic horror is full of inexplicable magic, and ties to the themes of weird fiction have always been here in Mass Effect. No one could ever explain the relays. Indoctrination is a sly take on common Lovecraftian trope of unholy secrets driving you mad. A connection to Lovecraft even backs up the ultimate tragedy of Shepard's sacrifice. Anyone familiar with games based on Lovecraftian myth are probably familiar with the old adage, it's not a matter of if you'll die, it's how. In fact, space opera and Lovecraftian horror go together so well that perhaps you can't distinguish the two sometimes, until something of, dare I say, Leviathan proportions makes the connections obvious. And herein lies my argument on DLC. They should have just been part of the main game. More context makes tragedy more interesting, especially the Leviathan DLC's Cthulhu flavor. And so perhaps Mass Effect 3's initial reception is a perfect example of the problems that DLC has, especially when trying to reconcile it with a strong narrative. How do you sell something that's optional story, but also important story? Ideally, you don't have to. And this brings me to my final point. A game is an interesting object. There's tremendous capacity for storytelling in games but they are still products, and products need to be sold. I'm more than willing to take flack on everything I've presented in this video, and I really want people to challenge me on the things I say, but this last part is something which I don't think I'll ever easily change my mind on. I dislike marketing in general. I once lived with a guy who once said, advertising is a tick that sucks the blood out of art. It's stuck with me and makes me mad every time I see a billboard. In the end, I think the things I personally find lacking in the wider context surrounding the game's reception in 2012 can all probably be drawn back to its position as a product. The perception of the game, what it has to say, and what it has to offer the player, is so powerfully influenced by marketing, and Mass Effect has simply always been sold on player choice. This isn't bad, necessarily. It's just a facet which I think people forget about when they consider narrative in games, especially in the AAA market. Obviously, those who took their complaints over the ending to groups like the Federal Trade Commission, and the US Better Business Bureau, and the British Advertising Standards Authority, didn't overlook marketing's role in their disappointment, but they reacted to it inversely to how I think we might be able to. Rather than holding a narrative up to marketing as the standard it should have met, why do we feel we can't hold marketing up to the standard of the narrative? Mass Effect 3 was undeniably spun on the PR front to have a different ending to what was written, but why is this bad? Is this a failing of the game or of the marketing? Are the two separate? Consider From Software's Bloodborne, a game which very intentionally didn't advertise itself as cosmic horror even though that's precisely what is underneath the old English gothic aesthetic. I think a solid argument could be made that Mass Effect 3 potentially exemplifies something like this falling over, either because the team wasn't entirely transparent with each other about it, or perhaps they had pushback from EA, who were desperate to bring in a broader crowd to the series finale, and had a specific image of the game they wanted to push. Everything I've touched on is kind of part of the AAA business model in some way. Game mechanics don't go untouched by publishers. DLC certainly doesn't go untouched by publishers. I guess what I'm saying is, I believe that tragedy isn't inherently flawed as a resolution for video games. We should never think it should have not been attempted, and if it goes to pieces, we should pick them up and examine them, over condemning tragedy or the writers. I don't have the data to substantiate a claim that modern publishers prefer gratifying endings over emotionally depleting ones, but I will say I think the business model of publishing is set up to discourage risk-taking when it comes to writing. That said, there are still people making the call to write and publish risky games. Thank God for Firewatch, a perfect example of this happening more recently on a slightly smaller scale. Firewatch was actually the impetus for the script. I can't find it now, but in the initial wake of journalism surrounding Firewatch, someone out there wrote that tragedy shouldn't be attempted by video games. If I can talk about Mass Effect 3 for as long as I just have, I think I have to respectfully disagree with that idea. Tragedy in games, in many ways, I think, works better than anywhere else. That's what I feel Bioware was very close to with this ending, a bold move that could have struck a chord with many people. Maybe it did for some, and the game's actions will echo on, and subtly alter their future. Maybe sometimes things that don't seem explicitly impactful, can be. Maybe sometimes a heavy sacrifice in present, pays off much later down the line. 
This video was made possible in part because of all my fantastic patrons. Your support really means the world. If you like what I do here, please consider checking that out, giving the video a like, or sharing it with someone who might enjoy it. I want to give a special thank you to my top tier patrons. Emily Snow, Nicholas Gambarini, Macy, Zach Rainville, Jack Mells, Nico Blakely, Eugenia Wu, GC Positive, Maddie Ireland, Mark B. Writing, and Writing on Games. Thank you all so much, and until next time.